and I'm going to share my screen. And as always, if anyone has any questions, just put, um, you know, put something in the chat or take it off mute and I'm completely happy to answer anyone's questions. So tonight we start talking about branching. And branching is the process of learning how to ask Python a question and get an answer that you understand. Um, it seems real easy to ask a question to the computer um, or anybody. You can say, is the sky blue? And somebody can say, yes, the sky is blue. Or somebody can say, no, the sky isn't blue. Um, and you can ask, you know, questions, well, how fast am I going? when you're driving a car. It's very difficult to ask questions like that to a computer, no matter what language you're writing, or at least in any of the languages I've experienced. That's because inherently computers are binary machines. They have two states, on and off. It's like a light switch. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. It's not even a dimmer switch. It is literally an on-off button. And at the, at the basest form of a computer, that's what it has. And while we have been able to get a lot of things about a computer to be really fast and really, you know, you, you see all these great video games on the computer and, and you don't think that underlying that is really just a small bit that's been flipped to being on or off. Why am I saying all this? Well, because when you ask a question to a computer, you're only ever going to get one of two answers. You're going to get on or off. And in this case, it's going to be you're going to get true or false. The only two answers you can possibly get when you're asking a question and asking Python to make a decision for you. So that means that we as programmers have to learn how to ask questions to the computer using Python. And this is one of the first areas where I find that new programmers start to get confused because we want to ask a question like we're talking, but we can't ask it like that to the computer. So it's important to understand how to ask the question and what happens when you get the answer. And even so far as how does the computer determine the answer. Once we understand all those things, then we can take, um, we can take all this knowledge that we're gaining and really put it to use writing a program. And this becomes very important even if you're just looking down to the game that you're going to have to turn in. That game is about looping, functions, and um, branches. Everything's about a branch. So that's why it's important to understand the basis of what you're doing here when it comes to uh, branching. Okay. Enough said. So the concept of branching is that you're asking a decision and the way it looks is that literally, if, if you looked at the flowchart stuff, you are branching. You are going in one direction or in another direction. You can't go in both. And that's called mutual exclusivity. So if you have two related questions, um, and you only want something to happen when, the, when one question is going to be answered true, then you can make it mutually exclusive so the other one never happens. And we'll go back into a little bit more of that. So let's go down and start by looking at our syntax. So let's see, where's a good place for the syntax to start? Okay. So we have two new keywords. We actually have three new keywords this week. We have else, we have, sorry, we have if, we have else, 
and we have elif. And we'll get to elif in a little bit. The first thing you always have to do when you're asking a question to the computer is start with the word if. You can have other mutually exclusive statements that start with something else. But if you're going to ask a question to the computer, you have to start with the word if. That's just the way Python is. It's all, all, all lowercase if, and Python knows at that moment that you're about to ask it to make a decision. And everything that comes between the word if and a colon is what they call the statement or the expression. And that expression can be evaluated to one of two things, like I was talking before, that light switch on or off. Well, when we're talking about expressions, we're talking about true or false, but it's basically the same thing. It's on or off. So the, the syntax is pretty simple when you think about it. An if statement at the beginning and a colon at the end. But all that stuff in the middle can be set up in a multitude of different ways. So it's my belief that if we all understand the basics, then that becomes easier. Um, so what does an expression look like? Well, an expression is a left-hand side and a right-hand side that will evaluate to either true or false. So let me open the code and show you what I mean. So simple if. Well, this has an else. We'll just go to simple. Which one? That one we'll do in a bit. Um, we'll do this one, even though it has an else in it. Let me take that down. So, okay, there. Um, so this is just a Python script. I have this variable my int. You know, it's a variable, it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And it equals 4. Could have been 22. That 4 is just an example here. So here I have my if statement on line 6. I have if, it starts with an if, it ends with a colon. By the way, that colon is going to become the bane of your existence because it gets forgotten so often. And I'll show you what happens when it gets forgotten. So when you see it when you're writing your code, you can go, okay, I forgot the colon. And you don't have to get frustrated. So I have an if statement. I have it, Sorry, I have an if keyword. And I have the colon that ends it. And then in between, I have the question. Now, that doesn't look like any question I would ask a human being. But it is how to ask a question to Python. What this is actually saying is, and it's really a statement. It's not, it doesn't get phrased as a question. It, the, the statement is, my int is greater than 3. If that evaluates to true, if it is in fact true, then we will hit line 8. And if it does not evaluate to true, we won't. And in this case, we'll hit line 11 because it's in the else. And we'll get to else in a minute. So let's run this really quick. And I'm on simple branch. Well, I just have to create a simple branch. Okay, so I'm just going to run this in the debugger. I'm on my int. It's a, just a variable. We're all good with those these days. So now I'm here. And what is going to happen is if I look at this, if I look at my int here, my int is 4. If I say the statement 4 is greater than 3, when I look at that, I say that's true because 4 is an integer is greater than 3 is an integer. So when that happens, I am going to be what they call inside the code block. 
you'll notice I came to line 8. Now there's some very specific things going on here. One of the first things is that this print statement is not left justified with that if. That is on purpose. Python is a space delimited language, which means that the only way it knows to do something on a conditional basis is because it is properly indented from the statement it's associated with. So this print statement is indented to the right one. That will tell Python, hey, I'm, I'm associated with this if statement and I'm here in this if block. So it's okay to run me assuming line six is true. So in this case, I'm just going to print in the big time and then everything stops. And everything stops because there's nothing else to do. Even though there are these lines of code down here. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. So, um, so that is the basic concept of what we're doing. We have an if keyword, an expression, a colon, and then we have whatever happens inside the block only if that's true. So now if I change this to one, okay, and I run this again, I'm going to have my lovely variable. I'm going to get to line six. Python is going to say, hmm, is one greater than three? Or more true, it's going to say one is greater than three. And it's going to say, ho, ho, wait a minute, no, that's not true. So when it evaluates that expression, it's going to say, sorry, that didn't work. Now in our case, we're going to go into the next phase of it, which is the mutually exclusive other block, and it's going to say nope. But you'll see the difference is when one was not greater than three, it did not come to line eight, it came to line 11. And so now I'm just going to add another print statement. Uh, it helps if I can type and spell. So if I run this again, I'm just going to run it this time. Well, I'm not going to run it this time. I'm going to debug it again. So I have one. We know I'm not going to get into line 8, but I am going to get into line 11. Now I added line 14, and I added line 14 for a reason. The reason I added line 14 was to show you the difference between inside the, the block and outside the code block. And so you'll notice I hit line 14 when I also hit line 11 when I went to the if statement. And if I change this back to 4 and I debug it again, you will see that I now hit line 8 because my int is greater than 3. And then I still hit line 14. Well, why is that? It's because this, this line of code, is not associated with any block. It's just there in the global space. So that's inside and outside the block, and that's what an expression is, and that's what an if statement does. This is, in fact, a true branch. Um, so the else statement. So basically, an else statement is, what do I do if this is not true? That's what it does. It says, if this is false, then do this. That's all it says. Could this be another if statement? Yes, it could. But then it wouldn't be mutually exclusive. Okay? What happens here is that Python knows that this if and this else go together. 
And there is no possible way you could ever write a statement that could replace this else. And why would you want to? Because Python gives it to you. So what, I, what do I mean by mutually exclusive? What I mean is if um, line 8 is executed, line 11 will never be executed. If line 8 is skipped because this is false, line 11 will be executed. And that's what we saw on our last run. So that's what mutually exclusive is. If one happens, the other cannot happen. It's that simple. And it is very, it, it is one of the basic principles for making decisions in a computer. Understanding the concept of what mutually exclusive means and then understanding how it's useful. And by the way, stop me if you have any questions. Does anybody have any? No, nope. okay. So, um, let's keep going. More if else. So basically what they're doing here is they're just saying that you can nest an if else statement. So you can put an, oh, sorry, I missed elif. My bad. We're going back. Uh, there we go. Multi-branch if else statement. So we now have this third keyword. We had if, we have else, and now we have elif. L if is again follows that principle of mutual exclusivity, but it allows us to have multiple mutually exclusive sets. For a while in my younger programming career, I was writing a programming language. It was a proprietary language. It had some AI stuff in it, um, but it had um, it, its basic engine was made up of if elif statements. That's what its basic engine was made up of. And and there were a lot of them. Um, so this is something that you can use to make complex decisions in um, a computer program to make related complex decisions. So LIF basically just provides an extra level of mutual exclusivity. Is this it? Yeah. So here on many branches, that's what we have. So what do we have here? We have a variable. And I'm going to input my age. And then I'm going to here, and I've got all these different things. Now you'll notice some similarities. The first similarity is that they're all looking at val. So when you're dealing with if elif statements, generally you're looking at the same set of variables. Okay? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, hey, is this, um, you know, all these things are related. Well, how are they related? Well, we're testing them against the same variable, so that's how they're related. And then what is the right decision based on whatever that value or set of values is, because you can do this stuff on a set of values. So basically what I have here, and we're, by the way, we're going to go through these Boolean operators in just a minute. I have a less than statement, uh, and, and these are very much like mathematical statements. I have greater than or equal and less than or equal, and don't worry about these ands right now. We're going to get into the Boolean operators in just a little bit. But what I wanted to do with this is I wanted to show you what a series of mutually exclusive statements is. So I'm going to run this really quick. This is many branches. I don't think I have a... Yeah, I didn't, sorry about that. I didn't have a run configuration made for that yet. Come on. There we go. So I'm going to run this real quick. And 
I'm going to show you what it does. Okay, I'm going to input my age of 42. Um, so, we know that val is 42, which means val is not less than zero. So, line one evaluates to true. Okay, so I did not have an invalid age. I'm sorry. 42 is not less than zero, so line four evaluated to false. The next one is val is greater than or equal to one, and that's true. And val is less than or equal to five, that's false. So we actually won't go in to that to line seven. Here we have 6 and 9, 42 is, is greater than 6, but is not less than 9. So I'm not in elementary school. 42 is not less than 13, so I'm not in middle, middle school. It is not less than 19, so I'm not in high school. And I'm just plain old. So that's what it's going to print. So that's what an if else, sorry, if else else uh, kind of ladder looks like. And it's, they're all related because they're all working against the same value, the same integer. Um, okay, so those are if else statements more if else. You can nest your statements. And what nesting allows you to do is do even more complex questions. Maybe you want to, you've got, you've got a higher level question and then you want to, you know, assuming that higher level question evaluates to true, you then want to go and evaluate other conditions associated to that. And that's why you can do nested. And by the way, there's no limit to nesting. I mean, it would hurt my brain if I nested way too deep, but there's no limit to nesting. You can nest as deep as you want. And that's all these are. These are just nested if-else statements. Once you're here, this evaluates separate from anything else. And the only thing that it cares about, the only thing that else cares about is this statement. It doesn't care about any of the other statements. By the way, if I'm going too fast or you need to stop and ask a question, go ahead. I know some of this can be a bit uh, complex when it's your first time. So, um, yeah, you can have multiple distinct statements if you want. I prefer the if, else, else statements. Okay, here are our operators, equality operators and inequality operators. So this double equal sign, you'll notice up until, you know, um, when I talk about variables, I say, you know, it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I say single equal sign because this is the double equal sign. And double equal does something very different than single equal. Single equal is assignment. It is taking a value and assigning it to a name. Double equal is a Boolean operator. It is asking a question. When you see the double equal sign, you are saying, okay, Python, you're making a decision and you're making it based on equality. You're making it based on whether the thing on the left-hand side of the double equal sign is the exact same as the thing on the right-hand side of the double equal sign. So again, we have left-hand side and right-hand side, but we, um, but it's, it's equivalence, it's not assignment. So that's the difference. So when I have a double equal sign, I am saying A is identical to B. And if it's not, I'm going to evaluate to false. There is the opposite of the equality operator, 
which is the not equal. So that is an exclamation point equal. And that means the thing on the left-hand side is not identical to the thing on the right-hand side. And that can be very handy, um, especially if you have lots of things that you have to evaluate for, but you really only care that it's not one of those things. Um, so those are the equ equality relational operators. We are going to get into the other relational operators. So these relational operators look a lot like the stuff we did in math because they are. Um, in this case, we have less than, greater than, less than, or equal to, greater than, or equal to. And that's exactly what they mean. The thing on the left-hand side is less than the thing on the right-hand side. The, the value on the, you know, for greater than, the value on the left-hand side for greater than, sorry, the value on the left-hand side is greater than the value on the right-hand side. And the same with equal. And the equal after the greater than or less than is just saying include the value. So if, um, so if, on the left-hand side, you said 2 is greater than 2. That would evaluate to false because 2 is not greater than 2. However, if you said 2 is greater than or equal to 2, that would evaluate to true because 2 is equal to 2. So that's kind of the difference. It's how you are going to evaluate. And then... We have operator chaining. So you can basically say A less than B less than C. And some people use this. It's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. I prefer to put um, a Boolean and or Boolean or in the middle of it because I think that makes it more readable. But you can chain your operators. You can say A less than B less than C. And it will perform the comparison left to right. So it will say, is A less than B, is B less than C? That's how that is read. So you're not saying is necessarily C less than A. It's not going to jump like that. Python's going to say, A is less than B. And if that is true, then it's going to say B is less than C. And if those things evaluate to true, those two different statements evaluate to true, then your whole statement evaluates to true. Your whole expression does. Boolean operators and expressions. So, um, so a Boolean value is true or false. True and false are keywords in Python. Capital T, true, capital F, false. So you can actually check this, say, is this true or is this false in Python. You can, you can use true or false on the right-hand side of a single equal sign. Um, and there is a specific way that you look at a Boolean expression, and that's what Table 3.5.1 shows you. Uh, because... You can and and or Boolean expressions. And this just isn't this way for Python. This is the same for pretty much every computer programming language I have ever dealt with. So it's important to understand what's in this table. I know this is kind of not an exciting table, but it's important to understand. This kind of stuff is the bread and butter for programmers. Understanding how to combine expressions and get a computer to make a decision in a in a very efficient manner is extraordinarily important. That, that's what we do, okay? So if the way you read this table is if A is false and B is false, then the outcome will always be false. If A is false and B is true, the outcome will always be false. If A is true and B is false, the outcome will always be false. If A is true and B is true, 
then the outcome will always be true. So you see a pattern there. It has to be true and true, or if you have five expressions, they all have to be true before the final result will be true. So you have interim result and um, final okay. result. Oh, shit. Whoever just, just joined Facebook. There we go. I think everybody's muted now. There is an or. So we just said what happens if you add them together, if you and them together. Now we're talking about if you or them together. So that's a different way of combining Boolean expressions. In this case, it's pretty much almost the opposite of an and. So false or false is false. False or true is true. True or false is true. True and true are true. True and true are always true. And so now we have this little third table over here and it's like A and not A. So basically it's just telling you what the opposite is. The opposite of false is true and the opposite of true is false. Seems pretty straightforward, but they needed to say it. Um, so we're about to get into complex, more complex branching, and you have to understand this table to understand how that's going to turn out. So we have an and, an or, and a not. The word and is a keyword in uh, Python. The word or is a keyword in Python, and the word not is a keyword in Python, or actually lowercase and, lowercase r, and lowercase not. These are Boolean operators that allow you to create complex statements. The purpose of creating a complex statement is to give yourself more options. So if we go back to the program we were just running, we can see that I have put some AND statements here. And what I want to do is I want to evaluate for something between. When you see, when you're reading code and you see an expression that has variable greater than or equal and variable less than or equal, you could also do that without the equal sign, then you are actually, then, then as a human, that is really between. So you're looking for something between 1 and 5. So that's how you would read that. And this one, you're looking for something between 6 and 9. So when you're reading through the labs, and, you, and they say the words between, this is what you need to do right there. So if we run this again really quick, I'm going to input my age. Just I'm going to say that I'm 12. So my value is 12. Value, value is less than 0. That's a false. Value is greater than 1. That's a true. And value is less than 5. That's a false. And we know with an and, a true and a false is always false. Now I have value is greater than 6 and value is less than 9. So the first part of the expression evaluates to true. The second part of the expression evaluates to false. Now I am saying elif value is less than 13. 12 is less than 13. I am going to go in to, and it's going to execute line 11 and I'm going to be done. The console is going to say I was in middle school. So that's how that works. If I run it one more time, I promise only the last time, and I put my age as 7, then we will see, so I, I know that 7 is greater than 0, so we're all good on line 4. 7, so 7 is greater than or equal to 1, that's true. 
7 is less than or equal to 5. That's false. True and false is always false. Now I'm here and I say 7 is greater than or equal to 6. That's correct. And 7 is less than or equal to 9. That's also correct. So now it's going to print out that I'm in elementary school. So that's how that works. And let's see. Membership and identity operators, in and not in. Now, when we get to list, this is going to become very important. It's going to make your life a lot easier. However, right now we're just introducing the concept. And what basically you can do is you can say, hey, Python is a value in a collection or a list of things. And, con and um, the opposite is, hey, Python, is it not in a list of things? Maybe you want to add it, but you don't want to add it twice. So you want to make sure that it's not in. Or maybe you want to make sure that it is in so you can do something with that list. That is what in and not in mean. I think I have one of those uh, compare lists. That compares them. That compares them. I don't have one, but I can create one if it's real important. But basically, you're just using the in operator. So let's keep going because I have a feeling there is a lab that you guys want me to take some time on. Order of evaluation. It's identical to how you learned in algebra. The order, the order of evaluation is the same as the order of evaluation in algebra. Parentheses make everything happen first. Uh, multiplication, division, modulation, plus and minus happen in that order. Uh, relational happens next. Not happens after that. And happens, the logical and happens second to last. And or happens last. So that's how it works. And that just means you know when things are going to happen so you can sit down and read and understand what's happening when your if statement doesn't work, especially when you start to get complex uh, conditionals, when you start to get complex expression in your branching. You have to understand the order of operation. Um, code blocks and indentation. I talked about this a little bit. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because it is one of those things that will drive students nuts. So I did not do that. Uh, there is, and I probably won't do this right now, there is uh, a, a Python file called Simple Boolean. And this goes through and actually prints out the ands and the ors. So you can see what's happening when you're doing an and as opposed to when you're doing an or. If you guys want me to, let me know and we'll walk through it. If not, it will be out there because it's going to take a little, uh, uh, several minutes to go through one of the labs. Um, so if I go back to my simple if, well, I actually didn't do this one, but I have a, a simple if dot py. Very, you know, I put in an age and I determine a hotel rate based on their age. Um, I get 20 bucks off if I'm over 65. That's what this basically says. So it's 155, and if I'm over 65, it becomes 130, 135. Um, this is all fine and good. And if I want to run this, where is this? This is simple if right here. If I want to run this and I put in 65, you will see that I don't get a discount. And then if I run it again, and I put in 66, you'll see that I get a discount. So that just means everything worked. My if statement worked, and my else statement did its job. But this is all properly indented. If I don't properly indent, I take out that indent. One thing you'll see is all these lovely little red squiggly lines came up. That's because PyCharm is telling me that something is very wrong. You will not get this kind of feedback in Zybooks.
So my suggestion is if you are having really weird behavior in Zybooks, copy and paste it into your pie charm and see if pie charm gives you lots of red squiggly lines. And then when you've got it much better, put it back in to Zybooks. Um, but anyway, if I run this, I have this wonderful little error that says hotel rate, indentation error, unexpected, and indent an indented block. So what that is saying is that there's an if statement, or it could be an elif, or it could be an elf, and something is an indented right. So you got to fix it because it won't run. So I'm just going to indent this twice. I'm going to run it again. So now I have another indentation error, but we know that print is indented properly. But hotel is not. You'll notice that I only indented it two, but print is indented three. And actually print is tabbed. So I'm going to tab this in. They have to be aligned. If they are not aligned, there's a problem. So this print is not aligned. What happens if I run it? Well, I get another indentation. And this says unindent, is, unindent does not match any of any outer indent level. So that means that this line is off. And it's off because it's not indented enough. So make sure that that's right. And this, if you do this, and else is not left justified, you're going to get another indentation error. Indentation errors are actually one of the most accurate error messages you're ever going to get with Python because it actually tells you the line that has the indent issue. A lot of other uh, errors that come out of Python will have absolutely nothing to do with the actual line they're giving you. So that is what indentation is and what code blocks are. Okay. Why is the if statement above not indented as well? Because it can't be. So here's what Python does. That's a really good question, by the way. Python sees this if statement. And you'll notice everything, well, all of our programs up till now, everything has been left justified. Absolutely everything. If you had right justified any, if you had moved anything in one space, Python would have given you an error. Like this, there is actually an, indenta an indentation error on line three because I added a space. Python assumes everything is going to be left indented. Or in the case of a, nor a, a file, a text file, it's going to be at column one. All of these letters are in a column in Python. Hotel, the H in hotel, the U in user, the I in it, and if, the E and else and the P and print are all expected to be in column one. If Python does not detect it in column one, does not detect anything but a space or a tab in column one, and the next character um, in column two or column 99, it's going to give you an error like we just had. So Python expects everything to be in column one. If it's not in column one, it's because it is inside a code block. So that means the if statement, has that I has to be in column one, or Python would just give you an error. If this were here, Python's going to say I have an indentation error in five, because it has to be um, in that first column. Now, inside the block, remember this is inside the code block, lines 6, 7, and 8 are, they have to be indented the same. And you can do it by spacing, or you can buy, do it by tabs, but you're not supposed to do it by both because some Python 
compilers will uh, complain. So I always tab, and, I, and it also makes it much easier for me to align because this H is starting on, on let's see, that's one, two, three. It's starting in column four. So the hotel is in column four, so the print has to be in column four. So this P in print has to be in column four, and this P in print will have to be, or you'll get a weird indentation error for that as well. So these all have to be aligned, but they cannot be just, they cannot be left justified. They can't be in column zero. And this has to be in column zero, and it is simply the way the compiler works or the interpreter works in Python. It expects you to have things in certain positions. And if you don't, it's going to default to an indentation error. Does that pretty much answer your question, Joey? Cool. Okay. Um, so if you have nested blocks, if you have nested if statements, you are simply going to indent them the same way you would indent anything else. So if you have an outer if statement, you're going to, and you have an inner if statement, this inner if statement is just going to be indented one. And then you have something in that inner indent, in inner if statement, then that's going to be indented again. So it looks like a cascade, or kind of a reverse cascade. And that's the way it works. That's simply how Python expects it. And so as programmers, we have to give Python the syntax that it expects. Um, so be careful with your indentation. I, it is something I see again and again and again. I see stuff like this. And students start to go crazy. And it's because there's a space off somewhere. Um, that's one of the reasons I tab. So conditional expressions. Um, Okay, so these are, these are specific expressions, and they're kind of a shorthand. And they're called ternary expressions, ternary operators and expressions. And um, they're useful sometimes. I don't use them all that much because I find them a little bit hard to read, but a lot of people love them. I work with programmers who think these kind of expressions are the best thing in the world because you can do a lot on one line of code. You can do a whole lot on one line of code. And basically what it is is assuming it's true. So you have expression when true here. That means assuming all of this, you know, assuming this comes out to true, if this if statement comes out to true, do this. Otherwise, do this. That's how that reads. So in, in any of these cases, so well, you can do it two ways. You can do it this way with an if and an else statement, or you can do it this way. My var equals expression one. That will, Python will do that if this condition is true. Otherwise, it's going to say expression two. It's that easy. Um, and like I said, some people love these because they're, they're physically writing a little bit less code. I find them a little more difficult to read, so I do them this way. Both are completely appropriate and completely acceptable. This is a flavor versus function thing, um, and this is, this is specifically flavor. There is nothing faster about either of these two modes. So writing one line of code will not make Python do less work than writing four lines of code. So you pick what you like, what makes more sense to you, and you go ahead and do that. Um, Twitter decoder, we're not going to do that. Okay, smallest number. So let us find the pseudocode for smallest number. Is that right? Uh, yes. So, and by the way, all this pseudocode will be up on the Google Drive. Or sorry, it will be up um, on the YouTube with the links to Google Drive. So, what do we have here? What we have is write a program whose inputs are three integers 
and whose output is the smallest of the three values. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use our mutual exclusion and our ability to do if, elif, and else statements to get the smallest value. So you're going to have three input statements. We've done input statements for two weeks. We know what the input statements are. We're just going to have three variables, first, second, and third. Okay, so now we get to the meat of it. This is multi-branching, it's mutual exclusion, and if you have to go back and reference, this is this is iBook section is where you're going to find it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say if first is less than or equal to second and first is less than or equal to third. So we're doing a compound statement and we're using the AND Boolean operator. So we have to understand how true and false works with AND. And these little, uh, little bubbles are telling us where to go look. So when we're dealing with less than or equal to, we're going to go here look at these relational operators. When we're dealing with Boolean operators, we're going to go to section 3.5. So that's just a little roadmap so you can go back and refresh yourself if you're not 100% certain. So we have this if statement, and what we're doing is we're comparing the first number to the second number and the first number to the third number. If the first number is less than or equal to the second number and the first number is less than or equal to the third number, we know that the first number is the smallest, and we're going to output that and be done with it because then we have elif, which is won't happen if the if evaluated to true, and we have else that won't happen if the elif evaluated to false and the if statement evaluated to false. So the, the elif statement does very similar to what the if statement did, except this time it compares the second. So it said, is the second less than or equal to the first? If that's true, and second is less than or equal to third, then it's going to output second, and you're done. If the if statement has evaluated defaults and the elif statement has evaluated defaults, then the final thing and the only thing you can do is output the third number. So that is how you would go about 3.11. And this is a practice in multi-branching and relational Boolean operators. So the next one is seasons. So this one can be a bit daunting for students. Um, and it is kind of a large program. So let's go back and find the right one. Uh, here we go. Okay. So here, this is a lot of code. So when you go into this, don't write everything at once. Start with the first if statement and put in variables and see if it works. When you're writing code, and this is just the way I've done it and the way it works for me, I don't write a whole big program all at once. I never write a whole big program all at once. I go baby steps. I will write something small and then I'll test it and see if I get the expected output, putting different, um, putting different values in for the different variables. And once I'm happy with that, then I go and I do the next thing. And once I'm happy with that, then I go and do the next thing. So in this case, so that's how I would break up a big assignment like this, because this is the biggest one you've done so far. So what I've got is I've got two inputs. I've got a month and a day. And this is kind of an exercise in all of the different kind of complexities you can have with just two input variables. So we have basic input output. We know what we're doing there. So we have a lot of if, elif, nested stuff going on here. So let's just go over this a little. So we're going to be putting in the month and the day. And we're going to, we're going to start by looking at January. We're going to start at the beginning of the year. So if month is January and day is greater than zero and day is less than or equal to 31, then we're 
output in winter, and we're done. Even though you see all this code, you will realize this is an elif that's associated with this. This is an elif. It's associated with this. If this elif does not evaluate to true, none of this stuff happens. So again, the same with this elif. If this evaluates to true, all of this has been false, and none of this will happen. It's just that simple. So we go down and we are evaluating it very similarly. We're looking at March, and if the month is March, we have more calculations to do because we split March in almost half. March isn't all spring and it isn't all winter, it's between the two. So we have to check for that and we do it based on these nested if statements. So if the day is greater than zero and less than 19, then we're still in winter. And if the day is greater than 19 and less than or equal to 31, then we're in spring. And if somebody put in the number minus 1 or they put in anything over 31, we're going to tell them it's invalid. And it's important to be able to tell them that it is invalid. And we're going to continue on like this for every single month, having the nested if statements for the months that are split that are split, you know, somewhere, you know, like day 19 or day 20. Um, and that's the pattern that we're going to follow until we're all done. And the very last thing we will put is invalid. Invalid will be put there if the month, if you put the month in as X, it, you need to have, make sure it puts invalid. If you put the day in as 99, it's going to have to output invalid. So... That's what the pseudocode looks like. Does anybody have any questions before I move on to the next pseudocode? Okay. Um, let's see. Many branches. We already did that. I wanted to see if there was one that was closer to that, but there isn't. Okay. So, floor. We're going to go over that. 3.13. Okay, so this is the last one. It's another non trivial assignment. Um, it is, again, small input, lots of, lots of evaluation. What they want you to do in 3.13 is they want you to put in a number. And they want you to tell them how many dollars, how many dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies can be gotten out of that number. Sounds easy enough. There is a pattern. There's a definite pattern to it. Uh, but you have to understand how to use the floor operator. And they mention the floor operator all the way back in Module 1, and it's less than a paragraph. So this can be confusing. I have a small program called Floor, which just shows you how to get the floor operator and then how to truly get the remainder. You can't use modulo, modulo here, the percent operator, because it won't work right. You need to use the floor operator. So we're going to run through this one really quick. And then we'll go back and look at the lab, and then we'll be done. So I've, I'm going to debug this. I've put in uh, 150 as my money. Oh, let me make this bigger. My apologies. I put in 150 as my money. Um, I'm only doing hundreds and quarters here, so 100, equal, um, 100 equals 100, quarter equals 25. So I want to know how many dollars are in that. So I find that by using the floor operator. So the amount of money I put in, floor operator 100 will tell me the whole number of dollars that are in 150. 
So the whole number of dollars that are in 150 is 1. So I'm going to print out 1. And now I need to find the remainder. How much is left after I take out that 100? So how do I find that? Well, I say the total amount of money I have it minus dollars times 100. So this is going to be 1 times 100, so it's going to be 100. And that's going to be the amount that's left. So the amount that's left is 50. So now I want to know how many quarters go into um, that I can get out of the amount left. So here you'll see that I am doing remainder, and actually I'm going to say quarters. That is better. And then, so we are now going to have quarters, and that's the beauty of an interpreter. You can change it one line at a time. So the, the number of quarters, uh, sorry, a quarter is 25, and quarters, oh, its remainder is 2, sorry. So the remainder is 2, and then the number of quarters is 2. So that's basically how that works. Let me run this. I hope that wasn't too confusing when I changed it to quarters. Oops. Um, I will have this up probably tomorrow, hopefully morning, if not sometime around noon. It's late here for me, and I work full time, so I do my best to have it up on Friday. Um, so yes, this should be up sometime tomorrow, and you guys, of course, can use it whenever you're working through your stuff. So if we go back really quick to the pseudocode, we're basically doing the same thing, but on a larger scale. First of all, you have to check for the validity, all right? If what they input is less than or equal to zero, you have to output no change. Everything is done. After that, you're going to set the number of dollars equal to input floor 100, um, and then you're going to get the remainder. You're going to do the same for quarters dimes, nickels, pennies. Then you're going to go and you have to now do the output correctly. Okay, you have number of dollars greater than zero output number of dollars. So you have to put in dollar or dollars depending on if the dollar, if there's only one dollar or if there's multiple dollars. And the same with quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. Um, so that is what 3.13 does, and that's why you have to use the floor operator. And um, does anybody have any questions before we end the class? I am going to assume the 3.13. Yeah, this here. Here is the 3.13 pseudocode. Um, and like I said, this pseudocode will also be um, on my YouTube channel. A link to this pseudocode will be on my YouTube channel so you can actually get to this image just like you can get to all the scripts. The pseudocode and the scripts are actually on Google Drive and the link takes you to them on Google Drive. So they're available with the YouTube video. So if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to call it a night. I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, I have a question about the discussion for this week. Is it due tonight or Sunday? Um, your initial post is due on Thursdays. And your uh, if, I can't remember off the top of my head, check the rubric, but if this is one that requires you to respond to your classmates, that has to be done by Sunday. If it is not one that has to be done, that where you have to respond to your classmates, then you're done. Then, oh no, wait a minute, if it's not one that you have to respond to, then it's due Sunday. So double check the rubric. Okay.
So your, your response is due on Sunday because this is a pass-fail one and you are not required to respond to your classmates. You are, you are, you know, required to give a full answer for yours. So it's great a little different than the discussions, but it's not due till Sunday. No problem. If that's good for everybody, then I am going to call it a night. You guys have a great weekend. Oh, and by the way, uh, next week is Thanksgiving week. I will not be doing one of these next week, but I will post um, a, I will send out an announcement and post an announcement in my class with the lecture from last term that goes over the week four stuff, um, just because it's Thanksgiving week. So don't, ex I, I won't be here live, but there is that. And there's also about four other videos for week four. So you're welcome to watch any of them. Um, and everybody have a great evening.